So it's a wonderful opportunity to be here and uh, in this great city. Um, and like all great cities, uh, Chicago has a great art institute. And if you can carve out a few hours sometime during the weekend or if you stay over another day, I would encourage you to uh, go to the Art Institute where there are a number of Paul Clay uh, paintings on display. Um, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the uh, clay, but to see them, I, I make a point of going every city I'm in, if there's an art gallery and I have time, I will go and I'll seek out the paintings and other works by clay. So this is the man. Um, the um, stamp on your left is a, a Swiss stamp from 1979 commemorating the 100th birthday of Paul Clay. And if you use Google, and I think everybody uses Google, uh, there was a doodle on December 18th of this past year uh, of one of Clay's paintings commemorating the 139th anniversary of his birth. So I have a few disclosures to make. The first is I'm not an artist, uh, nor am I a historian. Uh, the second disclosure is all of the medical records of Paul Clay were lost in a fire. And the third is, uh, actually, I'm the second choice for the speaker tonight. Um, a curator from the Art Institute was the first choice, but something came up uh, and uh, the curator couldn't make it. So if you have dinner plans, you might want to leave now. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, but I am a student of the disease, systemic sclerosis, scleroderma, and I've read everything I can get my hands on about uh, Paul Clay. Um, and also, I have to disclose that HIPAA rules protect individually identifiable health information about a decedent for 50 years following the date of death. So I don't think I'm going to break this particular federal law uh, in this presentation. So I'm going to divide the talk into three segments. The first is about his life and the beginning of his art and the tumultuous times in which he lived. And I think if, in order to understand his art, you really have to understand the background. So as a physician, I would say this is the social family past history. Then we'll get into the second part, which is about his illness and what we know about his illness, keeping in mind all of his records were lost. Um, but what we know is based on his letters, his diaries, and the words of other people who, who knew Paul Clay. And finally, I'll end with some thoughts on, about the impact of the illness uh, on his art. So the story begins uh, on December 18th, 1879. And just uh, in a very small town, pardon my German, Munchenbuchsee, uh, which is a small uh, town about uh, 10 kilometers northwest of Bern, uh, Clay was born. His parents were both musicians. Uh, his mother was a singer, and his father actually taught music to other te music teachers. And they, of course, uh, thought that uh, their son also would follow in their footsteps. And in fact, he was a very accomplished musician at a young age and played in the Bern Orchestra uh, as a teenager, as a violinist. But when he turned, uh, in fact, um, what happened along the way was one of his grandmothers gave him a box of chalk pencils when he was 10 years old. And this is the first recorded work of art by Paul Clay, uh, a drawing that he made when he was 10 years of age. And I think it's remarkable how detailed it is, and I think fairly sophisticated for a 10-year-old child to make this drawing. So he was captured by art, although music was still a very important part of his life and, and part of his art in the future. So he grew up in this very small, very provincial uh, village outside of Bern. And in order to really study art, he moved at age 18 to Munich. And this is uh, Clay as a young man. 
uh, he was captivated um, by going from this small provincial town to Munich, which was the center, really, of avant-garde art, much as Paris was at the time. And he wrote that he really enjoyed the free life, the international comradeship, and the unusually good music performances. And this is a photograph of Clay. This is Paul Clay playing the violin. This is a string quintet. I've been told that it's a Schubert quintet uh, with two cellos. Um, but Clay was very much um, captivated by his life in Munich as a young man, and he met many uh, people from all over Europe who uh, were very important to him in terms of his, his friendship and the development of his art. And so this is one of my favorite works, uh, an etching that he did uh, as a young man, not too long after he moved to Munich to study art. And you can notice it's, a, it's an etching and it's black and white, and there is a lot of detail to it, uh, and it's very humorous. So the story here is that these two men meet each other, and they don't know who's of higher rank, because none of them are wearing any insignia or uniforms or badges to denote their rank. So that each one is crawling or groveling, uh, bowing lower to uh, the other. Um, again, I think the Art Institute has a copy of this, but I'm not certain that it's on display. So while he was in Munich, um, he met Lily, Lily Stumpf, and this is Lily, and this Paul here, and his father, Hans. And Lily uh, was a pianist who did piano concerts and taught piano. And she was the daughter of a Munich uh, physician. And much to the dismay of her parents, she agreed to marry this young artist. Uh, and, and then they began their marriage living in a small flat where she would give piano lessons in the drawing room and Clay would use the kitchen as his art studio. One of the people that Clay met who had a tremendous influence on him and on a lot of people of the time was Vasily Kandinsky, the Russian emigre living in Munich uh, and um, who had a profound effect on or influence on modern art. This is um, a painting called The Blue Rider, a painting by Kandinsky. And this painting and the name of the painting was the inspiration for the formation of a group of artists led by Kandinsky known as the Blue Rider Group. And there were uh, many people in this uh, group. Uh, there were um, painters, there were musicians, there were poets who were members of the Blue Rider Group. And Kandinsky invited Clay to be one of the members of this group. And he, at, at the time, was just beginning to become more uh, famous, if you will, at least in, in Germany. A very important event took place in 1914, and that was when Clay, with two of his other uh, artist friends, members of the Blue Rider group, uh, Louis, Louis Mollier, and Auguste Mackey went, took a steamship and traveled to North Africa, to Tunisia. And these are some photographs from that uh, trip. This is on the ship going over. This is somewhere in Tunisia. And this trip had a profound influence on Clay as well as his companions, his artist companions who went with him. Clay was enchanted by the, the light and the colors of North Africa. And he painted this painting, which is called Tunisian Garden, many years later. But he wrote to Lily when he was in Tunisia. He said, I know that it will possess me forever. This is the great moment. Color and I are one. I am a painter. So he evolved on this trip. In fact, some art historians say that this trip was not only important for Paul Clay's development, but actually changed or affected uh, modern art history. But 
Several years later, things weren't so happy. So I mentioned, uh, or I should have mentioned, that uh, Paul Clay's father was German. His mother was Swiss. And in Switzerland, uh, citizenship is determined by paternal descent. So Clay, who was born and raised in Switzerland, was considered to be a German citizen. And so while living in Munich, in 1916, he was conscripted into the Imperial Army, the Prussian Army, for, during World War I. And this is a picture of Clay. Um, he was first in the reserves. He was not uh, sent to the front lines. In fact, ironically, his job, one of his jobs during his service was painting camouflage on the wings of German airplanes. Again, he did not see direct battle, but two of his dearest friends, members of that Blue Rider group, August Mackey and Franz Mark, who had also become quite famous as young artists, were each killed on the front lines. And this had a profound influence on Clay. This is one of his etchings from 1960. Uh, 16, you see a dead soldier here, and the title of this etching is To Die for the Cause. So things were not terribly happy for him at that point in his life, but after the war, things got better. And perhaps his happiest time was the period of time between World War I and World War II. He was becoming um, more recognized, famous, if you will, as an artist. And he was invited uh, by this gentleman, Walter Gropius, to join the Bauhaus. And the Bauhaus was a movement that uh, combined applied art, fine art, and architecture. And um, Gropius invited Clay and a number of other people, including Kandinsky, who's shown here, this is Paul Clay, um, to join and to teach art at the Bauhaus. One of the books from the Bauhaus era was written by Paul Clay, and it's entitled The Pedagogical Sketchbook. It's a tiny little monograph in which he details how to draw. And it's, it's really incredible how he describes it. So he described a line as a dot that went for a walk. And he describes curves and angles. And uh, this was a very uh, important book that he wrote at, at the Bauhaus. The problem was that the Nazi, the National Socialist Party was taking control of various parts of Germany and Austria at the time. And when the National Socialists took over the parliament in uh, Weimar, the Nazi flag, the swastika was raised, uh, the Bauhaus was closed. And they moved to Dessau. And several years later, the same thing happened there. And Clay and other members of the Bauhaus were uh, stripped of any sort of uh, professional appointments that they had. He was confined mainly to his house. He went away for a t short time. When he came back, he learned that the Gestapo had been in his apartment. Um, so it was a diff very difficult time. And I found this quote just recently in preparation for this uh, presentation. Gropius' aim was to introduce soul into the age of the machine the Nazis was to introduce the machine into the soul. And I'll show you this painting. This was done by Clay in 1922, so early, uh, bef long before the uh, National Socialists had taken over, but it's called the Twittering Machine. And you can see how humorous it is. There's obviously a machine here with a crank, and then the nature is, interacting with this. Um, a very important painting, um, and I'll come back to this painting in a moment. So 
he was, this is a painting called Struck from the List. So after he had been dis, dismissed from his post uh, at the Bauhaus, he then went to Dusseldorf, same thing happened there. So here is a paint, probably a self-portrait. He's been struck from the list. And so in late December 1933, Clay immigrated from Dusseldorf back to Switzerland. Now, many of you have seen some recent, more fairly recent films called, one of them is called The Monuments Men. Another one is The, the Woman in Gold about the Nazis who looted uh, artwork uh, from private homes, private collectors, uh, museums. Tens of thousands of works of art were uh, looted by the Nazis. And in 1937, the Nazis put together a, an exhibit that opened in Munich. It was put together by this person, Joseph Goebbels, who was the Minister of Propaganda for the National Socialist Party. And on the opening day, you had several people here. This is obviously an Italian a member of the Mussolini fascist group, and Adolf Hitler attended. And the purpose of this art show, which was entitled Degenerate Art, was to display two or 300 works of art from about a hundred different modern artists uh, it, denigrating the art. Um, in fact, 17 works by Paul Clay were included in this show. Uh, Clay was described in the uh, pamphlet for this art exhibit as being insane or schizophrenic. Um, and this was to illustrate to the German people that this was not the kind of art that would be acceptable under the Third Reich. And this tour opened in Munich. It went to 11 different cities in Austria and Germany, and it closed in Berlin, at which point much of the art was burned or sold. And among those tens of thousands of works of art that was uh, auctioned off was the Twittering machine which was purchased by a Berlin art dealer for $120, fortunately saved, and now is in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And uh, so if you're in New York, you should definitely go by to see this. Um, this um, is one of the paintings that Clay made um, around the time of that degenerate art exhibition. It's entitled Revolution of the Viaduct, and it's meant to um, show people breaking the ranks of totalitarianism, uh, showing independence, and perhaps, this is my own reading with the different colors, uh, diversity. So Clay definitely was affected by the politics of the day. So what about his disease? The first indication that I've been able to find uh, that he had uh, was developing scleroderma was from a letter that he wrote in around 1930 when he was, would have been about 50 years of age. And he wrote, there is nothing more hostile than water turning into ice. Never before had I endured such pain in my fingers during such hot weather. I think some people here could relate to what he may have been talking about. Of course, now, if we saw in our clinic a 50-year-old man with Raynaud's phenomenon, we would be very concerned about scleroderma or some other underlying connective tissue disease. So the next summer after he had left Germany and gone back to Switzerland is when Clay became very ill. And this is a photograph of Paul and Lily, his cat's name was Bimini. This cat, I think, appears as a model in several of his paintings, but that's pure conjecture on my part. But he was ill, he was seen by an internist, a dermatologist, I'm not sure who else may have seen him. But the initial diagnosis, and this is a letter that Lily wrote to one of her friends, 
The initial diagnosis was, bron was bronchitis with complications of the heart and lungs as a result of measles. It's not likely that he had measles, but it is likely that this was the first non ray nose phenomenon uh, aspect of his scleroderma. Um, he's uh, wearing his bathrobe here. He's got his pipe in his hand. His doctors forbade him from smoking his pipe and from playing his violin. And I'm not sure he complied with either of those uh, proscriptions. In her diary the following year, Lily wrote this. Because of problems with his skin, blood tests were done for calcium, phosphorus, and metabolic activity. The physicians insist now that it could not be measles. What is it then? In any case, it is a miracle that he's alive. So they've changed their diagnosis from measles. They still don't know what he has. And he maybe he's getting a little bit better, but he was obviously very ill at that point. We know that soon thereafter, he had involvement of the gastrointestinal tract. These are not his x-rays. <laughs> um, they've all been lost. And I'm not sure they were doing barium swallows in the 1930s. But these are words from his own diary. He's, he went away to a sanatorium to, or a spa to help recover. And he wrote back to his wife, Lily, the diet, I imagine, is going to do me some good. The difficulty is more one of the mechanism of swallowing. He had dysphagia and dysmotility. And then, very strikingly, he wrote later to Lily about another gastrointestinal manifestation that plagues so many people with scleroderma. He wrote, I have qualms about traveling. It's absolutely hell for me if I have an episode of diarrhea in the car. It does not happen every day, but I have to anticipate that it might. He also had issues with his mouth and his teeth. And he wrote, and if you, if you can relate to this, I think uh, many of you will, I have been spending a lot of time at the dentist, and this state of affairs is going to continue, but I am becoming accustomed to it. He really is very skillful. So you're lucky if you have a skillful dentist who understands this disease. What about his joints? So I found this recently, around 1937. Remember the, his words from the pedagogical sketchbook about a line as a dot that goes for a walk. He wrote this in 1937, the line. My lines of 1906-07 were my most personal expression, and yet I had to interrupt them. They are threatened by some kind of cramp. I just couldn't make them come out. This could have been arthritis, it could have been tendon friction rubs, it could have been the beginning of contractures in his hands. But clearly, as you will see, his art changed as a result of this. Here's an example. The year before he became ill, he painted this painting called The Creator. First of all, it's very colorful, and you see the very fine lines facial expression, and the fingers are straight. This is a painting called Small, Hand, Small and Large Hand, painted in 1939, the year before he died. There's no color. The face is blank. And the hands, I would say, at least the small hand, and the large hand, too, show contractures. He also had pulmonary symptoms. He said, he wrote to Lily, I inhale as deeply as possible. My dyspnea depends on the trail, whether going up or going down. It also depends upon the weather, and it also depends on how much food I have in my stomach. This was a man who loved to hike and walk in the hills and the mountains of Switzerland, and he was becoming short of breath. But he never lost his sense of humor. This is another thing about Clay that I admire so much. 
he always punctuated things with a little sarcasm. So there was a small incline up to his house where he was living in Bern towards the end of his life. And he wrote, this is now my Matterhorn. What about his skin? Well, here are two photographs of Clay at his easel, one in 1938 and one in 1940. And I think you can see the changes that have occurred over the face, the skin over the nose is tighter. Um, some people have speculated that there's some loss of pigment here, maybe some darkening here. And there's clearly are changes in his hands that were not evident two years prior in 1938. I sort of blew the second picture up a little bit because he's holding his hand very differently than he did before. And I cannot tell you if he has had amputations or has contractures. There's no record that I've been able to find to indicate either of those. And this is a, one of the last photographs that we have. Again, you can see he's lost weight. Look how his jacket is large. He has taut, shiny skin and uh, contractures and probably some um, acroosteolysis or tough resorption of his fingers. So finally a diagnosis was made. In December 1938, Lily wrote that the doctor had finally given us a diagnosis, vasomotor neurosis. This is a disorder of the nerves of the blood vessels and glands, and this is causing all the problems. Well, when I first read this, I was perplexed. And so I went over to the library at the medical school, and I got a textbook of medicine from 1927. This is Cecil's textbook of medicine. And if you look in those old textbooks of medicine for scleroderma, it falls under vasomotor neurosis, resulting from changes to the blood vessels and nerves. So they finally did make the correct diagnosis. Now we're getting to the end. And his drawings um, are just not paintings so much, but drawings. There are a lot of figures here. This one is called Burden. I think it speaks for itself. This one is entitled, A Sick Man Making Plans. And this one is particularly striking, Sick Man in a Boat, 1940. So this is presumed to be clay, dead or dying, again, faceless. And this is supposed to uh, be the reminiscent of the Greek mythology with uh, Sharon, the oarsman, rowing the dead uh, across the river Styx to uh, the kingdom of Hades. Clearly, he was consumed by his own mortality. But he wrote this, death is nothing bad. I long ago reconciled myself to it. How do we know what is more important, our present life or what comes after? I won't mind dying if I have done a few more good paintings. I won't mind dying if I've done a few more paintings. And remember, he cataloged everything he ever did, beginning with that crayon drawing at age 10. And over the course of his life, he produced more than 9,000 works of art. And I was able to get the numbers by each year and plot them out. And this was the year when he became so ill and he produced only 25 works of art. And then he recovered somewhat, and there was this burst of creativity, and I'm sure he was aware of his own mortality. He didn't mind dying, if only he could do a few more good paintings. And the 1939, the last full year of his life, he produced 1,250 works of art many of them those drawings that I showed you before. This is one of his last paintings that's entitled Gefangen, 
translated as captive. And this is felt to be clay surrounded by bars. And people have interpreted this in different ways. He felt captive by his skin disease and his systemic disease. He was also captive in his own country because the Swiss had not given him citizenship. They had many of the same philosophical beliefs as the Germans at the time. And um, Clay had applied for Swiss citizenship, but it was not granted at that time. So he was a, he felt imprisoned in his own skin and in his own country. One of his last paintings, Death and Fire. And this is a white death mask. This is the German word for death, Todd. So it's spelled T-O, the D is upside down. There's another T here, O, and then the mask is also a D. So again, consumed in the last part of his life with his own mortality. So he went uh, towards the end, of, middle of May 1940 to a sanatorium in the um, southern part of Switzerland, the Italian-speaking part of Switzerland, and his wife, Lily, joined him and wrote that his condition was fair for the first two weeks, but then he suddenly became very ill. He was fighting for his life. And towards the end of June 1940, he passed away. And there was no autopsy done. The Italian uh, physician who signed the death certificate uh, put as the cause of death Malattia di cuore, heart disease. He was cremated, and a number of years later, when his wife Lily uh, passed away and was cremated, they were buried together, their ashes were buried together, and this is the epitaph on, his, on their tombstone. In the here, I am utterly incomprehensible, for I dwell just as well with the dead as with the unborn, somewhat closer to creation than most, but far from close enough. So I usually end this talk when I'm giving it to health professionals with this quotation, the viewing and analyzing of fine art from a medical perspective increases our appreciation of the individual's suffering and teaches us an important lesson of the human aspects of medicine. We sure need this in the medical field these days. And I think it's an appropriate uh, way to close the talk to this audience as well. And this is my last slide. And I, I wrote down two words to leave you with. Empowerment and inspiration. So I hope that in the next two days, you will be empowered by the knowledge that you gain and you will be inspired not just from the work and life of Paul Clay, but from everyone you meet who has scleroderma who must endure. Thank you.